Deep within the shadows of our collective consciousness lies the eerie concept of demonic possession, a haunting notion that has lingered through the ages, weaving its tendrils into the tapestry of our faiths. The horrendous thought of being consumed, of succumbing to inscrutable forces that dwell beyond the veil of our comprehension. This idea seems to resonate within the darkest corners of the human mind and even within our very souls. Within this pitch black realm, a profound event unfolds involving a young woman, and what occurs would blur the delicate boundary between the world of the supernatural and the tangible, scaring the curious minds of those who experienced it, causing them to ponder if there certainly is a devil that lurks within the darkness. So join me as I explore the untold story of the terrifying exorcism of Martha Brozier, which took place in the 16th century in France. The mid-1550s, a time fraught with prevalent superstitions and deep-seated fears of witches and demons, creatures that hovered over mankind as menacing threats. A young woman named Martha Brozier, also known as Marta Brozier, emerged as a mysterious figure in an era characterized by the realms of black magic and the supernatural. Initially perceived as an unremarkable individual, she was merely seen as an eccentric girl, often keeping to herself, avoiding her neighbors, and preferring her own company. However, this unassuming, shy facade was shattered one rainy night. Martha, 20 years old at the time, had began to act exceptionally strange weeks prior to this night, drawing further and further into herself. She began to seem oppressed by something, something that she couldn't see, often being attacked or harassed at night. This night in particular, however, something very different took place. The petite woman, as lightning crashed, and rain pelted the outside walls of her home, unleashed a bone-chilling, demonic howl. This alerted her parents, who ran to see just what was happening. Upon opening the door to her room, they found their daughter perched in the corner of her room, upon her nightstand, contorted, her limbs twisting in unnatural directions. She then again opened her mouth and screeched. Her god-awful screams being so loud that they even pierced the ears of nearby neighbors through the chaos of the storm. Little did the family realize that night that this event would reverberate throughout the tumultuous year of 1576. Word spread like wildfire, and with the heavily religious lives of most Europeans at that time, these rumored otherworldly screams soon sparked immediate suspicion. Suspicion that the young woman could have perhaps been involved in witchcraft, that the devil had made his way inside Martha Brogier. The out-of-the-blue emergence of Martha's inexplicable behavior soon cast a sinister shadow over her neighbor, a woman named Anne Chevreau. Suddenly, this calm and relatively charming woman found herself unjustly accused of bewitching Martha. Soon the accusation spiraled into a web of superstition, and this paranoia would ultimately lead to Anne's imprisonment. She would be charged with the crime 
of practicing sorcery, a grim fate sealed by the village folk, whose fear seemed to further taint the air with an aura of malevolence and terror. The bizarre behavior of Martha, which had begun to escalate that rainy night in her room just weeks before, had seemed to only get worse. Alongside screaming in dual octaves and contorting into abhorrent, twisted positions, she began manifesting violent outbursts. She would try and attack anyone and everyone near her, even while contorted. Her teeth would gnash. Her voice emitted insults in a deep and guttural tone, as if several men were attempting to speak through her at once. Alongside this, blood-curdling screams occasionally burst from her. She began to roll her eyes into the back of her skull. She would extend her tongue to inhuman lengths, often biting in and laughing. She would also begin to converse in unfamiliar languages she couldn't have possibly known. These included English and Greek, alongside her native French. And even more disturbingly, she could speak these languages with her mouth closed, as if Martha was being used as a puppet. And alongside all of these unnatural symptoms, she also would boastfully move items without touching them, and when assaulting people or fighting restraints, she would show extraordinary strength, often taking multiple men to hold her down, and not without great struggle. As word spread about Martha, whispers of her alleged possession by demons, or even the devil himself, began to circulate, and in a surprising and extremely odd move, instead of recoiling in fear, her family embarked on a unique journey with Martha. They transformed her affliction into a macabre spectacle. They began traveling with her village to village to showcase the possessed woman they all kept hearing about and all of her grotesque glory. The alleged entity that inhabited Martha began to induce convulsions, terrifying roars, and a series of otherworldly displays that left spectators both mesmerized and petrified. The bizarre nature of her manifestations, including her ability to speak with a sealed mouth, extending her tongue to unnatural lengths, contorting her body in unimaginable ways, and exhibiting superhuman leaps even while lying down, defied logical explanation and solidified her reputation as a genuine supernatural enigma. This spectacle drew increasingly larger crowds, propelling Martha into celebrity status. King Henry IV was not merely informed of these freakish displays and rumors, but rather he received a detailed account of Martha's manifestations and the growing whispers of alleged demonic possession that surrounded her. Intrigued by the escalating tales of the tormented girl, the king took decisive action and issued a royal decree for an exorcism. This decree set into motion a chain of events that led to Martha being escorted to the hollowed grounds of the Abbey of St. Genesius, where a sense of anticipation and apprehension hung heavy in the air. It's important to note that I couldn't find information on any prior exorcisms, but rather, her family seemed to be profiting off of her spiritual dilemma, like a deformed creature at some kind of carnival or circus. Awaiting Martha's arrival at the Abbey was the eminent Bishop of Paris, a figure of authority and piety, who stood ready to confront the story that had captured the attention of the entire kingdom. Accompanying the bishop was none other than the king's personal physician, Michel Mariscott, a man whose skepticism towards the supernatural was well known. However, 
as Martha's case unfolded before him, Marescott found himself embroiled in a unique experiment that would test the very boundaries of his beliefs and challenge the established notions of demonic possession. For Mary Scott, this extraordinary situation presented an unparalleled opportunity to delve into the realms of the unknown, a chance to scrutinize the phenomena of possession with a keen eye for scientific inquiry. This exorcism, unlike any before it, became a crucible of investigation, where each detail, each reaction, and each utterance were meticulously observed and analyzed. As Martha stood on the precipice between the earthly and the ethereal, Mary Scott found himself at the forefront of a groundbreaking study that would ignite debates and discussions for years to come. The results of this unprecedented exorcism were not merely contentious, they became a focal point of scholarly discourse and theological deliberation, shaping the very fabric of beliefs and superstitions that permeated society. The revelations that emerged from this bizarre event continue to echo through the halls of history, leaving a lingering mystery that defies easy explanation and challenges the perceptions of those who bore witness to Martha's ordeal. The physician, driven by his growing suspicions, meticulously orchestrated a covert plan to validate his doubts. With the utmost secrecy, he carried out a daring swap, exchanging the sacred relic believed to be a piece of the true cross with a piece of mundane wood. This strategic maneuver aimed to unravel the tale surrounding Martha's eerie episodes and delve into the depths of her unsettling manifestations. Upon Martha's arrival at the solemn abbey and the subsequent confrontation with the bishop, the stage was set for a dramatic unfolding of events. As anticipated, with the presentation of holy objects, Martha's demeanor swiftly transformed. In the blink of an eye, she plunged into a tumultuous whirlwind of violence. Her rageful movements shook the very foundations of the abbey. The contorted form of her body convulsed as she unleashed a torrent of vile and profane utterances in multiple languages and in that horrible, deep tonality, each syllable dripping with an ominous malevolence. The priests, taken aback by the chilling display before them, struggled to contain Martha, resorting to allegedly using a piece of the real true cross to subdue her erratic behavior, to essentially drive the demonic entities back to the point where she could be restrained. Yet after this occurred, the situation escalated once more to full-blown intensity, objects hurling about as screams echoed. Once again, amidst the chaos, the alleged piece of the true cross was brought near Martha, and this triggered another visceral reaction, one that sent shivers throughout the witnesses. As the relic touched her, Martha recoiled in sheer terror, her face wincing in agony. Whilst being restrained and having the demon commanded to leave her body, a powerful and final scream came from her lips. She then fell limp. Upon regaining consciousness, tears began streaming down Martha's face. She was seemingly freed from the evil that had taken her. Those who witnessed the events were forever scarred by what they had seen. It was as if they had looked into the eyes of the devil himself. While the bishop interpreted this harrowing scene as conclusive evidence of demonic possession, skepticism loomed in the mind of the astute Mariscott. His analytical gaze honed in on the discrepancy 
and the pieces of the cross that were presented to Martha and how she had reacted to the swapped items. She had interestingly seemed to have a much more profound reaction to the decoy cross than that of the true cross. This perplexing disparity fueled Mariscott's doubts, prompting a deeper introspection into the complexities of the woman's affliction and the underlying forces at play. The intricate interplay of faith, skepticism, and the supernatural unfolded within the hollowed walls of the abbey, setting the stage for a riveting clash of beliefs and interpretations as the veil of uncertainty shrouded Martha's condition. The physician's clandestine experiment sparked a contentious debate that reverberated through the corridors of power and piety. Amidst the lingering cries of doubt and conviction, the true nature of Martha's plight remained veiled in mystery, awaiting further revelation as to what indeed had taken place that night. Mary Scott informed the bishop and other priests about his actions, stating that Martha's condition might be due to severe mental distress rather than possession. He considered this as evidence that there was no demonic influence involved. Despite Mary Scott's belief, the bishop adamantly maintained that Martha was under demonic possession, going to the extent of accusing the physician of blasphemy for suggesting otherwise, another horrible charge that carried heavy consequences for that time. The debate raged on, and consequently, although Mary Scott held strong suspicions that Martha's affliction was either a charade or a result of mental instability, he struggled to sway the church's opinion. Thus, the experiment at this juncture faced a setback in achieving its intended outcome. Despite the outcome, Mary Scott in the coming months would find unexpected allies and his beliefs within the church, unbeknownst to him. The Archbishop of Lyon, Charles Miron, shared Mary Scott's conviction and chose to push the boundaries of the experiment further, devised an elaborate plan to test his suspicions by concealing a key in red silk and presenting it to Martha as a fragment of the true cross. Additionally, he proposed swapping holy water with regular water to observe her reactions. Adding to the intrigue, he recited passages from Virgil's Aeneid in Latin, intended to be nonsensical to a demon, but potentially misconstrued as potent scripture by an ordinary individual. In essence, the entire exorcism would be a meticulously orchestrated charade. Martha stood before the archbishop, her body racked by spasmatic convulsions that seemed to ripple through her, being like violent tremors. As she stood in his presence, a sense of foreboding hung heavy in the air, shrouding the room in silence. Unbeknownst to Martha, a small vial of holy water was discreetly offered to her trembling hand, its sanctified essence shimmering faintly in the dim light of the chamber. With a trembling grasp, she ingested the holy water, her movements almost mechanical in their desperation for solace. However, the fateful moment arrived when a seemingly identical vial of water, carefully disguised as holy water, was presented to Martha. As the liquid touched her lips, a primal scream tore through the stillness of the room, reverberating with a raw agony that seemed to sear her very soul. The archbishop, his gaze now piercing and unwavering, observed these events, his mind a maelstrom of conflicting thoughts and conjecture. Why did the ordinary water evoke such visceral distress, while the holy water remained untouched by the flames of her torment? What sinister forces lurked beneath the surface of Martha? 
that they weave a web of fear and uncertainty around her very being. Moreover, the moment of truth arrived, as a relic resembling a fragment of the revered true cross was presented to Martha. The mere sight of this sacred object triggered a reaction so intense that it laid bare the depths of her inner turmoil with a stark clarity that sent terror through the hearts of those present. From here, the verses were read. Martha's reaction mirrored her encounter with the deceptive waters, blurring the lines between the sacred and the profane in a dance of otherworldly revelation. In the wake of these unexplainable events, Archbishop Miron found himself standing at the crossroads of disbelief and conviction, his resolve tested by the inexplicable nature of Martha's responses. The intricate puzzle of her reactions to seemingly mundane stimuli raised questions that transcended the boundaries of the natural world hinting at a presence that defied conventional explanation. As the archbishop delved deeper into the labyrinth of Martha's eerie manifestations, a cold realization began to dawn upon him. The revelations unearthed in the crucible of faith and skepticism marked a watershed moment where the veil of alleged demonic possession was lifted to reveal a complex framework of human frailty or deception. The implications of this groundbreaking revelation resonated far beyond the confines of the Abbey, challenging the very fabric of beliefs that had held sway over the minds of the faithful for centuries. Despite the apparent conclusion and the suggestion that Martha Brogier might have been a mere fraud, a charlatan, or possibly not completely sound of mind, her case still continued to stir controversy. Numerous witnesses attested to witnessing her bizarre episodes firsthand, insisting that her actions surpassed human capabilities, making it implausible for her to fabricate everything. Rosier herself maintained her assertion of being possessed and would ultimately persist in her tours until her death. Now before we go, the twists and turns of this case have churned up many questions. It's my conviction that this particular case could have influenced the Catholic Church all the way to the modern day, because nowadays, a person must be examined by a doctor as well as a psychologist before an exorcism can even be considered. Could Martha's case have caused this? All around pretty interesting in my opinion. If the young woman was possessed, just how did this occur? Was she cursed, bewitched by someone else, or was she herself dabbling with the dark arts? Despite her anguish and apparent pain, her family took her around like a traveling circus act and no doubt profited from the spectacle. This to me is obscene if she indeed was under demonic influence. To think that her own flesh and blood could be so exploitative is just heartbreaking, unless she was in on it. After word got out and she was properly exercised on the king's orders, just how or why would she show aversion to non-holy relics, such as the piece of wood resembling the true cross or the non-blessed water? And lastly, if she was seemingly freed during this event, why did she then return to touring as the possessed woman after the debacle? To me, this makes me question whether she was a charlatan or a fake, or perhaps someone who was very mentally disturbed, or sick with some kind of illness that was unknown to physicians at the time, or if she was truly possessed, in possession like most paranormal things we can never fully grasp. The truth is up to you to decide. Was the devil in the darkness? Or was he unmasked to reveal a very clever woman just trying to make a living through strange means? Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. 
please leave me a comment of what you think down below. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications if you're new here. Like this video by hitting the thumbs up button. And share this video around with friends, family, or on social media. All of that stuff truly helps me out tremendously. Especially with the ebb and flow of YouTube these days. Lastly, I hope all of you are doing well. Hopefully if you were suffering from some extra depression from winter, hopefully with it now being spring, you can start to feel a little bit better. I encourage all of you guys to do something, whether small or big, that allows you to express yourself. I know it's not a cure-all, but it usually helps me feel a little bit better with my depression. I mention this because I know a lot of you are like me, and sometimes you need an extra boost from a friend. You deserve to be happy, and as I've said before, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. But nonetheless, guys, I wish all of you a wonderful day and year. This has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. I'll see you guys very soon with another brand new video. In the meantime, remember to stay safe out there and take care.